Hello friends, I'm Janice Mitchell, a pelvic health physical therapist, and today we are discussing external support options. So what is external support and how does it help the pelvic floor? So stay tuned. Help! My organs are falling. That's a message that I cannot tell you how often I hear people uh, asking about and talking about like oh no, I just got a diagnosis of pelvic organ prolapse, or oh, I have this vaginal bulge, or this pressure, or this heaviness. So let's talk about external support options and how that might be able to improve your quality of life. First off, this is not individual medical advice. So I'm a physical therapist, but I'm not your physical therapist. This is not medical advice for you and does not replace evaluation by a qualified healthcare professional. Next, there are some red flags. So if you have any of these red flags, then you need to get checked out, okay? So we have uh, fever, chills, night sweats, unexplained weight loss, unexplained weight gain, altered mental status, uh, depression or suicidal thoughts, unexplained bleeding or pain, and trauma. This concept is at the core of everything that we're going to do here. So the forces from below must equal or exceed the forces from above or the organs will fall. So here, this little rim here is like your pelvic bones. Okay, so that's your pelvic bones on the outside. Then you have your bladder your uterus and your rectum, which most female bodies have. And then this layer here, this is, these are your pelvic floor muscles. And so here on this pelvis, you can see the bones on the outside and then the pelvic floor is at the bottom. And we'll go over some more anatomy with this. But basically, you have forces from above that are pressing down, but then you also have forces from below that are lifting up. And um, basically, these forces need to be stable. Uh, and the forces from below need to counteract and the forces from above, or you have pelvic organ prolapse, potentially. Here is a nice little sketch of the pelvic floor. Uh, so if you could imagine that this is a person that's cut in half, and we're looking at the inside of their right side of their body. Here, this hammock stand are your bones. So this would be the pubic bone in the front and the tailbone in the back. Then you have the bladder, the uterus and the rectum. So the bladder holds urine, the uterus is for babies, and the rectum is for poop. Uh, and then your pelvic floor muscles here connect at the pubic bone in the front, and they stretch all the way back to the tailbone in the back. Here is a, a well, not a live pelvis, but here's a pelvis that you can see. So here's the pubic bone in the front, and then we have the spine with the sacrum, and that's where the tailbone would be if she had a tailbone. And then here, uh, the pelvic floor muscles stretch from the pubic bone in the front, and they stretch all the way back to the tailbone in the back, and they go side to side. That's the vaginal opening, that's the anus, and that's the urethral canal. So urethral canal is where urine exits the body. Vaginal canal is for sex and childbirth. And the anus is where solid waste, liquid waste, and gas exit the body. So now let's look on the inside. Here are three canals. So you have the bladder and the urethral canal the uterus and the vaginal canal, and then the rectum and the anal canal. And your pelvic floor muscles stretch from the pubic bone, stretch all the way back here to the tailbone. Here is our schematic again. We're looking at the inside of the body with the pubic bone in the front, tailbone in the back, and our three organs. And then here you can see the pelvic floor muscles have gotten stretched out. So you see here they're nice and elevated and those organs are supported. Here on the right, those pelvic floor muscles are stretched out. You can see prolapse starting to happen where the bladder, uterus, and rectum are all starting to sag and fall down. So let's go over the anatomy. 
and we're discussing the forces. So the forces from below that are internal, you have the pelvic floor muscles, the fascia and the ligaments and the bony structures. Here is a nice side view again of the pelvic floor. So this is a female that we're looking at. This is the front of her body and the back of her body. Those are her glutes. This is the pubic bone and the tailbone and the spine. Here's the bladder and the urethral canal for urine, the uterus and the vaginal canal, and the rectum and the anal canal. These are the pelvic floor muscles that stretch at the pubic bone and come back to the tailbone. So let's watch this animation again. You can see as they squeeze, those organs lift and those canals closed and close. And when they relax, those canals open and the um, position of those organs drops just a little bit. The pelvic floor muscles are kind of like a trampoline. So here on the left, you have the trampoline. And then here on the right, you have the organs on top of that trampoline. So the trampoline needs to give, it needs to have stiffness so that it rebounds back up, but it needs to have give and flexibility so that it absorbs some of that pressure and that force from above. This is another analogy. I love, I love, love, love this video of a real trampoline. So you can see what happens when you have weight coming from above or pressure or force. That trampoline absorbs the pressure and then rebounds back up. And that's what should happen with the pelvic floor muscles. So here are the muscles. And then these pink things are the ligaments and the fascia that help to keep the muscles and organs in place. And then the bones uh, are what anchor everything together. Now, here, this is a pretend pelvis. So this uh, little hoop here, the hoop is your bones or your pelvis, and then the red fabric are your pelvic floor muscles that are lifting from below, and then you have your bladder, which is yellow, the uterus, which is pink, and the rectum, which is brown. So here's another little demonstration of this pelvic floor trampoline. So we have the bladder, the uterus, and the rectum. And you can see that that pelvic floor has some flexibility, right? It gives a little bit, but then it bounces back up. It gives and it bounces back up. And depending on the force and the pressure, it will it will give more and it will need to rebound back up more. If the pelvic floor possesses a certain stiffness, it is likely that the muscles could counteract the increases in intra-abdominal pressures occurring during physical exertion. Oh, that's a mouthful. So what does all of that mean? Basically just going back to the concept of the of the pelvic floor being like a trampoline. So you have these forces from above and you have the forces from below. So the pelvic floor is the force from below and let's say your organs are the forces from above. So the forces from below need to counteract those forces from above. Now, what are we looking at in terms of forces from above? So some of the things that cause pressure on top of that pelvic floor is gravity. The pelvic organs, the organ contents, and the intra-abdominal pressure. So we're just going to briefly cover on all these topics, but the main premise of our uh, talk today is external support. There are a combination of factors that impact the pelvic floor from above and that also uh, affect the pelvic floor and the forces from below. So here you can see this bladder is much fuller and this pelvic floor is much stretchier. This uterus is fuller. So why would a uterus be full? Uh, a baby, one of the most common reasons. And then a rectum that's full. And so you can see this pelvic floor has a lot more give and it's, there's a, it's hanging down quite a bit more than that initial one that we showed you before. Gravity is one of the biggest forces that uh, impacts the pelvic floor. So we've all felt uh, the effects of gravity one way or another. One, um, <clears throat> one way is on a roller coaster. So when you're climbing up and you feel those G forces on you, that's the effect of gravity. Another way gravity affects our bodies 
is with loose skin. And we can have loose skin and things that kind of flop around in various areas of our body. But here's one example of a belly that's kind of loose and isn't held up very firmly there. Another example is our breast tissue. So here we have breast tissue that is nice and elevated and here we have breast tissue that isn't that supported. The gravitational pull also affects your organs, causing them to shift downward away from their proper position. So here we are again with our little bladder, uterus and rectum. Here on the left, you can see the pelvic floor is nice and elevated. And then on the right, that pelvic floor is drooping and sagging and it is not providing very much support there to the organs and the organs are falling. Something else that can affect the pelvic floor is what's inside the organs. So not only do the organs provide pressure on the pelvic floor, but what's inside the organs. So imagine a bladder, okay? And you have a bladder that's empty. Well, that empty bladder isn't going to produce as much weight on top of that pelvic floor as a full bladder, right? Because a full bladder has, is full of liquid. And then you have the weight of the bladder plus all of that liquid inside. The same concept applies here to the uterus. So remember our anatomy. This is the pubic bone in the front, tailbone in the back with the spine going up. Here's the bladder and the urethral canal, the uterus and the vaginal canal, the rectum and the anal canal. Now we come over to the right and what's inside the uterus? We have a baby growing and look how much space that baby takes up and think about how much force and pressure that baby is putting on the pelvic floor. And then the same thing would also apply to a full rectum. So that rectum, if it's full, you can have quite a bit more pressure on the pelvic floor, force from above. And then the last force from above that we're gonna discuss is intra-abdominal pressure. You have four muscles that make up your core. You have the diaphragm on top, your deep belly muscles, your deep low back muscles, and the pelvic floor from below. And these four muscles work together to stabilize and to control movements, okay? So uh, I think an, an easy way to understand intra-abdominal pressure is this. So take your hands and I'd like you to put them on your belly, put them right, right below your belly button and kind of press in. And then I'd like you to cough. <coughs> so when you cough, you feel those muscles kind of tense up, right? Well, that's an increase in your intra-abdominal pressure. Now keep one hand there on just below your belly button and then raise your arm up. And you should also feel the muscles kind of tense up, probably not as much as they tensed up when you coughed. Now keep your hand there and raise your leg up like you're marching in place. Again, you should feel those muscles tense up. So that's indicating that you have an increase in your intra-abdominal pressure. Activity, movement increases your intra-abdominal pressure. It's a normal part of life and, and it's good, it's fine. We just need to control it and we want the muscles to be engaged to keep the spine, pelvis, pelvic organs in a good, stable, controlled position. Here's another example of intra-abdominal pressure. So here on the left is a zoomed in view of your bladder. Uh, this is a bladder that's full of liquid. Here is the bladder outlet called the urethral canal. That's where the urine is designed to exit. And then around that outlet, you have pelvic floor muscles. Now here on the right, here's some examples of things that increase your intra-abdominal pressure. Laughing, jumping, coughing, running, sneezing. All of these increase your intra-abdominal pressure. One thing that can happen with that increase is that you leak. Now this presentation isn't specifically talking about leaking, but this is an example here of what can happen when your intra-abdominal pressure increases. So here is a little video demonstrating that. All right, now let's get to the crux of the matter. External support. 
So external forces from below. We already talked about what some of the internal forces from below are, right? Your pelvic floor muscles, the fascia and the ligaments and your bones. Now let's talk about external forces. Remember, this is our pelvic rim. These are our pelvic floor muscles and those are our organs. This is one way you can provide external support to the pelvic floor. You're lifting from below. Now, it's not really functional to think about holding your pelvic floor from below throughout the day, right? You're not gonna walk around with your hand in between your legs. So what else can we do to provide some external support from below for our pelvic floor muscles? Here are some options. And so we're going to go over all of these options today and a few more. But the principle behind this is that these devices and garments are providing support to the pelvic floor muscles from below and a counter force to those forces from above. Again, here you have this device, this garment, and it's providing support to that pelvic floor and those pelvic organs from below. Here's a little demonstration of what one of them could potentially look like. So again, the rim here, this is our pelvic floor. That's our bladder, uterus, and the rectum is gonna come was a little tricky getting all these organs in without popping the balloons. <clears throat> yes. But we got it done. And so you can see instead of a hand providing support from below, we have a device that's, support, that's providing support from below. And so you can really see that that limits some of that sag that happened in that other video that you saw when there was no support from below. Okay, so now I'm going to share with you a little video that I made where I actually try on each of these devices that I'm gonna share with you. And I show you what it looks like on my body. I jump with it. And then I also put on a skirt over it and I put on a pair of joggers over it. So you can see, I don't like to see panty lines through my clothes. And so that's important to me when I'm choosing things to wear that I don't wanna see a panty line. Uh, so most of these are made to be worn over panties, but under your outerwear. So so of course you're not going to see somebody walking down the street with this white strap on. They're going to have something over it. And so uh, you get to see how it looks on me and how it functions with, with me. The first device I'm going to share with you is called FemJock. I've been using this device for close to 18 years and it's a really fantastic supportive device. So there's pros and cons of each one of these and I'll kind of talk you through what I experienced with them, but I encourage you to try things out and see what works best for you. Also, in this YouTube video, in the captions, I will include links for all of these so that you know where you can go to purchase them if you're interested in it. All right, so the first one we have is a FemJock. This is the front and that's the part that goes on the perineum and you can see that nice reinforcement there. And that goes in the back, kind of stretchy. And that's a size medium, I believe. So again, you would never see anyone with this. This would go on under your pants, but over your panties. It gives a nice amount of support there on the perineum. There, you can see what it looks like with this skirt over. So you can see a little bit of a line, but it's really not that visible. And if you're wearing a loose shirt or something over it, um, I don't think most people can tell. 
Now here's a light pair of joggers. So this is really the test. And again, if you were wearing a long loose sweatshirt, that's really not all that obvious. You can see me jumping. It's giving a good amount of support there in the perineum from below. But there is a little bit of a panty line. Next one is called the V2 Supporter. It's from a company called It's You Babe Official. And the nice thing about this one is that it's adjustable. So you can make it tighter or longer depending on your preference. Again, this one is made to be worn under your outerwear, but over your underwear. So there, and it's a pretty adhesive Velcro, as you can see. So I tighten it up just a little bit there so that you can see how adjustable it is. But again, you can tell that if you were having pelvic heaviness or pressure, this support in the perineum gives a good amount of support. And they come in several sizes and they also have options for um, pregnant people. Now let's do the test and see what it looks like with a skirt on top. Can you see the panty line? You really can. I don't like, I don't like that, but, but again, if you're using a looser skirt or a looser shirt, it's really quite, um, not really that visible. I'm pretty picky. And so you just need to kind of see what works best for you. And then we have the joggers. So this is, this is, in my view, I would never wear this out because you can you can just see that strap and I don't want to see that strap. But if you don't wear things that fitted or that doesn't bother you, then it's an option. And again, there's ways to get around this. You can put on a looser sweatshirt, looser pants. Now the next one is called the Secret Hideaway. And it is a little more lightweight support. It doesn't have quite as much support there, but it's also a little more discreet so you can see the adjustable straps there and it gives you some support there from your perineum again this would be worn over your underwear but under your outerwear let's do the skirt test not too bad it might, you might, you might see just a little bit, but it's very hidden. So I like the, the name Hideaway because with this garment, it really was almost invisible. And now the joggers. There's a little bit of visibility there. And of course I'm bending over and I'm putting my bottom right in your face. But, um, you know, that's kind of the point here. I wanted you to be able to see how it worked. Now this is a company called EVB Sports. And so this is a pair of shorts and they have other apparel too, but basically it has reinforced perineal support built in in the garment. So these are not really that stretchy. These are pretty, um, pretty compressive. So there's not a lot of give in these, but I can tell you that they are very, very supportive. So when you put those on, you feel like everything is kind of lifted up and in. So these are something that I would wear if I was going to be up and like moving all day. And look at that, you can barely see. You can see just one little seam, but I think if I adjusted the garment even uh, to coincide with the skirt seam, I don't think you could see it. You can't see a thigh crease there. And it's quite invisible and it really does give an incredible amount of support. I would not wear these if I was sitting all day though, because it's not that comfortable. So you can see a little bit of a crease there. 
But again, wear wear a longer shirt. But I probably wouldn't wear these with joggers. I would wear uh, I would wear it with a skirt. Now the next option is Spanx light garments. So this is something called commando control. So this is much more flexible. You'll see it. Um, it does not really have a reinforced perineum. It has a little panty guard there. But it does give some support. And, you know, just depending on what you're after. So it gives some nice support and lift, but not nearly the amount of support that the EVB Sport does. Let's see what it looks like over the skirt. And you just can't see it. It's invisible. There's no panty lines. There's no thigh lines. But the question is, is it enough support for you? So again, you have to determine does what works best for you. Do you need more support or do you need less support? And what type of clothing are you wearing? Let's see how it looks over or rather under some joggers. Looking pretty good. No panty lines. A little bit of a thigh divot there, but I don't think most people could tell. And then another option are Spanx. So these are literally Spanx. And they, you know, Spanx has different sizes and different compressive weights. All right, now we have compressive leggings. So these are actual Nike leggings. And again, you have different types of material and fabric. This is a very compressive kind of pulls you up and in, but it gives a nice amount of support from the outside and below. Something that I like to, um, I'm gonna pause it there just a minute. Something that I like to kind of use as a, as a, a guide about whether leggings are good or not. Did you see, let's do that little jiggle test that I just did. <laughs> So basically, if they jiggle, so if you look in the mirror and you wiggle, jiggle your bottom, and if there's a lot of jiggling happening on the outside, then there's probably a lot of jiggling happening on the inside as well. So this is nice and supportive, and I don't have anything else that I'm using, just these supportive leggings. And now I'm jumping, and I'm gonna do the jiggle test. And you just didn't see a whole lot of jiggle. It's kind of funny to do that in front of the camera though. Now we have jeans. So these are jeans that have uh, Lycra and these are, uh, you know, I have a good amount of space in these jeans. And you can even see a little looseness there. And it gives some support. So these would be comfortable to wear all day long, wherever I was. But if I needed a lot of support, they probably wouldn't be my go-to. Now these jeans are a little more compressive. They still have Lycra, but they give more of a lift. And you'll see in just a minute that they also have a high waist. And this gives a great amount of support. So again, I find that uh, that second pair of jeans is a really nice option. Okay, so I hope that that little demonstration was helpful and that it gave you a, a start to uh, what some of the options are out there for external perineal support. By no means is this all inclusive or all comprehensive. It's what I have and what I've been using, but there are definitely more options out there. And if you have an option that you think is a great option, send it to me because I'd love to link it and share it with others. All right, so now let's go over some of the common myths about external support. Number one, nothing major happens to the perineum during pregnancy, labor, and delivery. Are you kidding me? Well, this is a crazy myth, so let's, let's dispel it. Look at what happens to the pelvic floor. So here on the left, this is the pubic bone, that's the vaginal opening, and you have the baby getting ready to enter the vaginal canal. Now look what happens to the pelvic floor muscles. Look at the incredible stretch that those pelvic floor muscles go through. In fact, 
the pelvic floor muscles stretch between 1.62 to 3.78 times their resting length. Can you think of any other muscle in the body that can stretch almost four times its length without rupturing? Think about your arm. What about your bicep? If you took that bicep and stretched it four times its length, would it still be intact? No, it would rupture well before you got to that point. So the pelvic floor muscles are very, very special. Uh, something else here, six months is the time that it takes for most of the recovery to occur. And then by 12 months, uh, that's about the time that the pelvic floor muscles resemble the muscles immediately after a C-section. Number two, the perineum automatically returns to normal. No it doesn't automatically return to normal. Now, some people may not have to do very much and may not have any symptoms and that's wonderful, but other people may have symptoms and may not just bounce back. And so it takes some time and recovery. So let's look at this. Here, remember, is our pelvic rim. And so you have this perineum, the pelvic floor muscles here, and you have progressive levels of stretch. Myth number three, nothing can be done to help the perineum if you tear or have an episiotomy. Again, not true. There's a lot that we can do and far more than just external support. But let's just take a little look here. In this sketch, here is a sketch of the perineum. This is a grade one tear. So this is the anus, that's the vaginal opening, the urethral opening and the clitoris. And here's the labia majora and the labia minora. And with a grade one or a first degree tear, it's a superficial tear and the pelvic floor muscles aren't torn. With a grade two, the pelvic floor muscles are torn and it's going a little deeper here. And there's varying levels of grade two. Grade three, it's a tear all the way to the anus. And then grade four is all the way into the anus and into the rectal canal. Myth number four, all external support options cost a lot of money. Well, that is not the case. In fact, you may even have something in your closet right now that might work. So go check out your closet and see what options you have in there. Do you have some leggings that might give you some oomph and some compression? Do you have a pair of Spanx that might be able to lift a little bit? Do you have a pair of jeans that has some Lycra so you have a little bit of a give, but also can give you some support and compression? Myth number five, all external support options give the same level of support. That is not the case either. So here, let me pause that for just a minute. Here's an analogy of a sports bra. Okay, so are all sports bras equal? No, they are not. So here on the left, you have a very stretchy, um, kind of thin sports bra. And then this one on the right is whoosh. You have underwire support. You have uh, quite a bit of compression and lift. And here's a little video showing that. See how stretchy that is? Not a lot of support happening there. And then this one in the right, not a lot of give pretty stable fabric and then look at that support as well you have the underwire and uh, the molded cups so that provides a lot more support now here is an example of leggings so the leggings on the left are very stretchy the leggings on the right provide quite a bit more support so see, I'm just barely pulling on this fabric and there's so much give. They're very comfortable, but if I'm gonna be up and moving around a lot, it's not gonna give me a whole lot of support from below. It's not gonna give me a whole lot of compression. And now these, it's difficult to see in this picture, I think, but these have much less stretch. They still have give, but they're going to give me a lot more support and lift from below. So what types of other interventions are there for pelvic organ prolapse or perineal descent? Uh, so one option is surgery. Another option is called watchful waiting. And then you have conservative management. So we have pessaries, pessary-like devices, pelvic floor muscle training, and then the forces from below. So basically, all of these uh, I'm going to cover in another course, but 
basically that's a summary of it. Tip number one, choose what works best for you but consider support versus aesthetics. So depending on where you are on the spectrum, how much support do you need? And then how important is it to you to not have any panty lines visible and to not be able to see the device at all, to have it completely hidden. So you need to balance that. So how much support do you need? And then aesthetics. And where can you find that middle ground? Tip number two, external support should provide enough counterforce but should not be painful so as you can imagine you have your you know you have your pubic bone right here you have your tailbone and if you're providing a lot of lift and compression that may even be uncomfortable for you and also depending on where you are and your tissue healing and what's going on with your body so make sure that you balance and I would definitely not want any of this external support to cause you any pain Tip number three, the support you choose may vary based on your chosen activities. Okay, so basically what this means is that if you have a very light, sedentary day where you're sitting most of the day and you're not very active, you may not need that much support. But if you have a very heavy, active day, uh, you may need more support. Or if you just wanna go for a run, you may want to put on those EVB sport shorts right before you run and then take them off when you get back. Uh, it's really dependent on how much support you need and what you're doing and how long you're doing it for. Tip number three, the support you choose may vary based on your chosen activities. So if you have a very light sedentary day where you're not very active uh, and you're kind of lounging around or you may have a sedentary job, you may not need a lot of support. But if you have a very active job or you have a very active lifestyle, then you may need more support. And then specifically thinking about it from an activity standpoint. Let's say you need only a light amount of support through most of the day, but then when you wanna go running, you need more support. Well, that's fine. Use the additional support when you need it. Pull on those EVB sport shorts, and that will give you quite a bit of lift and compression for your run. And then maybe you're more comfortable taking them off uh, when you get home to lounge around in the evening. So basically your support may vary based on what you're doing and how long doing it for. Tip number four, the support you choose may vary based on your needs and your symptoms. So again, what amount of support do you need and what are your symptoms and how does it vary? It may vary in the morning where you may need less support in the morning and more in the afternoon. You may find that at different times in the month you need more support versus less, less support. It can vary. So just listen to your body and if you're feeling that heavy dragging pressure you might want to give yourself a little a little support and lift from below. Tip number five, combined internal and external support may be helpful. So again, we're going to cover that in another video, but uh, if you are going out for a run, maybe you need to have some internal support plus some external support if you're having symptoms. All right, so basically that's the end here of our pelvic floor muscle training, external support tips and tools. I'd love for you guys to drop comments or questions below in the captions, or here's another way that you can access me. So here's my email address. You can direct message me on Instagram, and then here's our website. And on our website, we have a section under, you go to get help, and then you click on about my body, and there's a section called prolapse and if you click on that prolapse we have quite a bit more content there as well and then lastly we are developing an online course for pelvic organ prolapse and so stay tuned for that thank you for your time and attention and i hope this was helpful Bye bye